So Roger Federer will be no doubt watching what's happening out on Centre Court at uh, the moment. And don't forget, coverage continues now over on BBC Two. And of course, later on in the evening, we'll have plenty of doubles action for you as well. That's what happens here at Wimbledon in the second week. So men's semi-finals day, Federer is through. Join us for more coverage in just a moment now over on BBC Two. Join us here at Wimbledon for now. Bye-bye. Sport Relief presents an equestrian extravaganza. Watch in wonder as our 12 celebrities attempt the giant leap from show business to show jumping. Way. Join me, Angus Deaton and Kirsty Gallagher for Sport Relief presents Only Fools on Horses. Tonight at 8.30 on BBC One. To enter the Sport Relief mile, go to bbc.co.uk slash sportrelief. Life should be simple. Meet someone, fall in love, live happily ever after. Trouble is, life's actually pretty messy. I can't do this. You know what I feel, don't you? I don't do affairs. Still, things are rarely what they seem. Because there's always another side to the story. Tasty. Very tasty. Synchronicity. How will you look at it? New drama coming soon to BBC Three. Monday, none of Lionesses talking to me after silly incidents making new girl feel welcome. Tuesday, still very tired. Lions ate my lunch again. Thursday, got chased by baboons today while mum was getting lunch. Was scared. Big Cat Week starts Monday at 7 on BBC One. This is BBC One in the East. Now the news with Darren Jordan, Natasha Kaplinsky and Stuart White. Tonight, a special edition of the six o'clock news from Regent's Park, where a commemorative service for the victims of the London bombings is beginning. Good evening. One year ago, four bombs exploded across the capital, ending 52 innocent lives. And all over the United Kingdom, people have been remembering and paying their respects to the dead. At midday, the nation stopped in silence. It's been a day of emotion for all those caught up in the events of July the 7th. Friends, families, relatives and survivors. I honestly believed that I would die and I still can't explain why I didn't. For all medical intents and purposes, I should have. And I still, to this day, don't know why I didn't. But at the heart of the service here are the memories of the 52 men and women who died. Today is for them. And here in the East in half an hour, new police tactics to drive the crime out of our picture postcard villages. And it's the moment of truth for only fools on horses as the cameras start to roll in Essex. Good evening from Regent's Park on the day we remember the events of July the 7th, 2005. The day 52 people died in suicide bomb attacks across the capital. Today, the relatives of those who were killed, along with survivors and ordinary men and women across the nation, remembered, mourned, kept silence and paid tribute. Here in Regent's Park, right behind me, a memorial service is to begin shortly. Later, we'll be back for the centrepiece of the service, when the names of all 52 victims of the attacks will be read out for the first time. That's in about 15 minutes' time. We'll also be hearing from those who lost loved ones on the July the 7th and assessing the legacy of those events. First, though, Nicholas Witchell on the day a nation remembered. London, at the start of the daily rush to work for millions of commuters, and on this particular day, 
of remembrance for what happened on these platforms and in these tunnels one year ago. Within St Paul's Cathedral, so often in the past a symbol of the capital city's resilience, candles were lit at precisely ten minutes to nine, the moment the three bombs on the underground were detonated. At the same time, at King's Cross Station, the Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, and the Culture Secretary, Tessa Jowell, were laying wreaths in remembrance of the bomber's 52 victims. Their tributes were placed alongside some of those left by families and friends of the dead, with the messages which speak of individual loss still so keenly felt. At Edgware Road and the other tube stations where the bombers struck, as the London rush hour was in full flow, underground staff had escorted relatives down to the platforms for private moments of reflection. Among those returning to the station today was a woman who was on the Edgware Road train when the bomb went off. Today was the first time she'd been back. I just remember seeing the people in there and, and seeing people dying and, and I think coming back today is really for them because I wanted to pay my respects um, having felt that sort of you know, an attachment to them in that hour that we were down there. In Tavistock Square where the fourth bomber detonated his device on the upper deck of a London bus, Ken Livingstone was joined for the wreath laying by the driver of the bus, George Saradakis, who still grieves for the passengers he lost. What really bothers me mostly is that they were under my care you know and somebody they are coming to my bus and uh, so cowardly uh, spread death in memory of all those who perished in the attacks at midday many in london and elsewhere paused for two minutes The Queen stood in silence during a service at St Giles's Cathedral in Edinburgh. The Prime Minister joined members of the London Fire Brigade at the brigade's headquarters by the River Thames. They were moments shared by people from different communities. These were spectators at the Wimbledon Tennis Championships. These were children at an Islamic school in Nottingham. And this was Beeston in Leeds, the community from which two of the bombers came and where there is a wish to move on. Because we're all sad, saddened by what's happened and the loss that people have suffered. And we want to move forward, yet still remember those that lost their lives in this. Back on the London Underground, a city whose resilience has been demonstrated across many generations, was going about its business and saying that it would not be intimidated. It had been a day when those who survived, albeit some with terrible injuries, came back to pay tribute to those who did not. When those who did their duty and much more that day came to add their flowers, and when the many communities which make up London remembered those who died in the London bombings of the 7th of July, 2005. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. The suicide bombers of 7-7 didn't care who they killed. Men and women died together, people from this country and from many other lands. 
Among the dead was Shahara Islam, a Muslim, an Eastender, a Londoner and British. Mark Easton spent the day with her uncle, Shamsul. He's never spoken about the events of July the 7th before, but today he decided to break his silence. At noon, Nazmul Hassan stood among the silent crowd, remembering his niece, Shahara, a young Muslim murdered, her killers said, in Allah's name. A wonderful and amazing person with uh, an extremely innocent heart. Thought the better of everyone, and uh, I wouldn't hurt a fly. I have no words to say. I first met Shahara's family the day after the bombings. Relatives choked with anguish. It would be another four days before the young bank cashier was confirmed dead, a victim of the bomb on the bus in Tavistock Square. Al-Qaeda's release yesterday of a video by one of the bombers convinced Shahara's uncle he should break the family silence. It was such an atrocity which has left uh, a permanent scar on the lives of many. I think yesterday's video was just... That was quite painful, I, f I, I felt. Um, it angered me immensely. His niece murdered, but his faith under suspicion. For Nazmul, the days after the 7-7 attacks were emotionally intense. I found my own racksack being searched by the police at Allgate Station, which is the station I use. Then I realised that the only people they were picking out at searching racksacks were anyone with a brown skin. I found that quite upsetting. I've suffered, my family suffered, um, as a direct consequence of these people who claim to be Muslims. But then, at the same time, I'm also being looked at with suspicion. And even now, there are times when uh, I've got my rack sack uh, over my shoulder and I'm going to work, come back from work on the tube. I do get, get, get a sense whereby everyone's looking at me thinking, OK, what's his game? Petticoat Lane. Uh, Nazmul, like London, Shahara, kind of is proud to be a Muslim, city. proud to be Behind British, gate, proud uh, to be a Londoner. Uh, looking around, you can see the vast uh, array of different people that are here. You've got your city folk and you've got your traders and you've got Asian people, you've got uh, white people, you've got black people. I would advise anyone and everyone, please go out there, make the effort of talking to your neighbours. So if they're from a different background, so what, they, they may think differently on religion to you. Have a debate, talk to one another, see what your commonalities are, see what your differences are. Don't fight over them, celebrate them. A leaden sky, a whisper of rain. On this Muslim holy day, Nazmul Hassan has prayers to offer. First, I'll be praying for my niece Shahara to rest in peace. Secondly, I'll be praying that we all take something positive to work with and build on for the future. 7-7 was designed to tear the multicultural fabric of London. For Shahara Islam's family, the prayer is that the tragedy serves to strengthen that fabric. Mark Easton, BBC News, East London. Most of us can remember where we were and what we were doing when the suicide bombers struck. Many lives were changed forever. Daniel Sanford now looks at the legacy of those terrible events. Every time I, I shut my eyes at night, I'm, I'm back in that tunnel. I can hear those people screaming. I can, I can smell that smell of the, the, the electrics and the, the burning metal, and it doesn't go away. My heart stopped sort of three times on the day. I just didn't think there was any way I was going to get out of there alive. Hey, hiya. Yeah? <laughs> How you doing? How are things? Good. Danny Biddle, the last of the 7-7 seven seven survivors to leave hospital. He lost both legs, an eye and his spleen. For the relatives of those who died and people like Danny, everything has changed. He'd been on the Edgware Road train, directly opposite Mohammed Sadiq Khan and he thinks he may even have seen the bomber triggering the detonator. Just a massive white flash, it's like a million camera flashes going off, um, like white noise when you're tuning the radio in, and with the force of the, the carriage expanding and compressing very quickly, it blew me out of the train into the tunnel wall, and then I was lying next to the train in the, the sort of crawl space, and I honestly believed that I would die, and I still can't explain why I didn't. For all medical intents and purposes, I should have. I'm very lucky to be alive. I've met a couple of families that, that lost people on a train I was on. And there isn't a bigger incentive to grab life with both hands and meeting somebody that lost their son on a train I was on. Danny, Just, thank you so Determined much. to carry on, Danny can't wait to get married and move into his new house. Got to get used to life again. It's going to 
be a big adjustment to be at home and doing things for myself again. I can't wait, but it's still quite frightening. That man took a lot from me that day, but he doesn't get everything. I finally get a little bit of control back. But what about the rest of us not directly involved? In the capital this week, it looked like nothing has changed. It was here in King's Cross Underground Station that the four bombers said goodbye and set off to detonate their devices. We don't know what they hope to achieve through so much death, but on most measures, they appear to have failed. More tourists arrived last year than ever before, and they're spending more. On the tube, there are no more security alerts than before 7-7, and the number of passengers is up to three million a day. What happened was dreadful, but it wouldn't change me. I wouldn't allow it to change me. I think if we did, they'd win, and I'm not going to win. I think um, around the surrounding weeks, around then, it, had, it did seem the atmosphere in London had changed, but it, sound, it seems to have got back to normal now. There have been changes, like these anti-car bomb barriers at Victoria, but they've just become a useful place to have lunch. The truth is the London bombings didn't have the same seismic effect as 9-11. In New York, even the skyline changed, and that didn't happen here. And if the terrorists wanted to affect our whole way of life, they failed. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, in central London. Well, those who survived the events of July the 7th will always remember that precious moment when, in the midst of the darkness, the horror and the pain, help first arrived and they knew rescue was at hand. When one of the bombs exploded on a tube train at King's Cross, the duty station manager, Simon Cook, was first on the scene. He's with us now. Simon, thank you very much for coming to talk to us That's on right. such a, a, a very sad day. Can you talk us through how you've marked today? Yeah, today's been very special for me. I came into work early, about 7 o'clock. I wanted to be around the staff that were there on that day, um, see that the day went as smoothly as possible for the survivors and the victims. You saw some terrible sights a year ago today. How have you coped with that over the last year? For me, it was very important to try and get the tube going again. All the staff at King's Cross worked flat out to get services back to normal as fast as possible. Um, and that really helped everybody to move on. Within a month, the whole station was opened up and we're providing a normal service and that, that really helped everybody to cope. An awful lot of thought and preparation has gone into today and how best and how appropriately to, to mark the events. Has it been quite a cathartic experience for you? It has, yes. It's, it's good to look back on it. Um, a lot's changed in the last year, especially around the station where I work. Um, it's opened up a, a new part of the station. Um, but it is good to remember what we had to go through that day and to know that we could help everybody in the way that we did. So it's really helped you to come to terms with the events? Yes, it has. Now, you've been at work today, Simon, haven't you? What was the atmosphere like on the tube first thing this morning? It was very quiet this morning. The normal morning rush hour didn't really happen. Obviously, some customers are still a bit nervous about using the tube. Um, but we had great um, support from the police. We had lots of staff in today, and the day went very, very smoothly. Um, throughout the day, numbers of customers started to pick up, so people aren't afraid to use the tube, and that's really positive. Simon, thank you very much for talking to us. We'll okay. leave you to get back to the service. Thank you, thank Simon you. Cook. Well, when the bombers struck a year ago, the man who had to respond to the chaos and the horror was the head of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Ian Blair. I've been speaking to him and I asked him about his own memories of that day. I think it's, it's, it's a jumble of memories, really, but they're all sharp. The first was the recognition of the scale of what had happened, uh, standing in my office realising that what we had planned for and feared had happened. The second uh, was visiting the scenes, uh, particularly the bus, because that was you know, available to see, realising the horror of what had gone on. Um, third, uh, sort of watching my own staff with a pride in what they had actually achieved, uh, the fact that they had just done what they needed to do at the scene. And then, I suppose, lastly, driving through the city in the late evening with a silence, a, a, a city that was very, very silent, but already a city that was coming back to life. And I think that's the very, very strong abiding memory of July as a whole, that London survives. Do you think that Britain changed on the 7th of July? I think Britain, yes, I think it did. Although I think Britain, probably better said, Britain woke up to the change that was already happening. 
We must remember that, that the Metropolitan Police had disrupted a number of major conspiracies to cause atrocity before that. Uh, but on the other hand, the public probably weren't that aware of it. On the 7th of July, the bombers got through. 52 people lost their lives on the 7th of July last year. There was one other innocent victim, Jean-Charles de Menezes, shot at Stockwell Station. The report into that is looming. Is that something you're bracing yourself for? Well, you know, that is a tragic mistake. Uh, and the Met you know, has learned lessons, will learn lessons, will face criticism uh, over that death. Uh, I see his death uh, as part of the whole terror uh, events of the summer. He was a victim of terror in the same way as the 52. Uh, and you know, we will, of course, uh, deal with it as it comes on. We will explain uh, how it went wrong, what we've done to stop it going wrong in the future. Um, and once again, I will be apologising to the Menethes family for that death, but the Met will go on. Is there anything that you fear in that report that will make your position untenable, though? No. Do you think we'll see another 7th of July? I fear that it is almost inevitable that there will be further attacks uh, and almost inevitable that some of those attacks will get through. That is the new reality in which we're operating. A last thought from you. This is ultimately a day of reflection. If there's one message that you'd like the British public to take away, what would it be? It would be that the British public is broadly magnificent, uh, that uh, the way that London returned to normality the next day, the way that we didn't see some upward uh, movement in the statistics about uh, race, crime and hatred between communities, the fact that communities reached out for one another, that's, that's what will win. I mean, these people uh, want death. London wants life. Sir Ian Blair, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Sir Ian Blair talking to me earlier. Well, it's nearly time for the names of all 52 victims of July the 7th to be read out at the service here in Regent's Park. Let's now rejoin the service. And the imprints of your feet on the threshold of the house, on the stairs, on the floral patterns of the carpet. They still gaze at me, bewildered. A sound is rising from our broken hearts. Where are you? Where are you? You have lent your smiles to the flowers. The entire house is the embodiment of your life. Who says you are no more? Who says you are no more? How can you not be? O oh, incarnation of kindness, O oh, our dearest, hold our hands, for we are so lonely. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I feared no fate, for you were my fate, my sweet. I wanted no world, for beautiful, you were my world, my true. And it's you were whatever a moon has always meant and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life which grows higher than the soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart, I carry it in my heart.
We now remember the innocent victims who lost their lives a year ago today. At Aldgate, Lee Baisden, Benedetta Chacha, Richard Ellery, Richard Martin Gray, Anne Moffat, Fiona Stevenson, Carrie Taylor. At Edgware Road, Michael Stanley Brewster, Jonathan Downey, David Fuchs, Colin Morley, Jennifer Vander Ann Nicholson, Laura Susan Webb. At King's Cross and Russell Square, James Adams, Sam Badham and Lee Christopher Harris, Philip Beer, Anna Brandt, Kieran Cassidy, Rochelle Chung for Yuen, Liz Daplin, Arthur Frederick, Carolina Gluck, Gamza Gunaral, Ojara Ikegu, Emily Jenkins, Adrian Johnson, Helen Catherine Jones, Susan Levy, Shelley Mather, Michael Matsushita, James Mays, Benaz Mazaka, Michaela Michelle Otto, Atik Sharifi, Ihab Sliman, Christian Njoya Diawara Small, Monika Suchotska, Mala Trivedi, at Tavistock Square, Anthony Fatai Williams, Jamie Gordon, Giles Vernon Hart, Marie Joanne Hartley, Miriam Hyman, Shahara Islam, Nitu Jain, Sam Lee, Chianuja Niroshini Paratasangari, Anat Rosenberg, Philip Stewart Russell, William Wise, Gladys Wundoa. The reading of the names of the 52 people who died a year ago today. Well, that's all from Regent's Park for the moment. I'll be back a little later with more from the service, but for now, it's over to Darren. Natasha, thank you. On to other news, a study suggests that whooping cough is widespread among children in Britain despite an immunisation programme. It says more than a third of children who went to their doctor with a persistent cough had evidence of the infection. Here's our health correspondent, Byron Jeffries. Come on. Come on. Family doctor Anthony Hondon sees a lot of school children with coughs, so many that he decided to investigate. He was surprised to find whooping cough is a common cause because most children are vaccinated against it as babies. What we're really saying is that if a child has a persistent cough, then GPs should consider the diagnosis of a whooping cough and do a simple and easy blood test. His research involved looking at older children with persistent coughs. Blood tests found that more than a third had traces of whooping cough infection. And that's even though most had been fully vaccinated as babies. That suggests the vaccine gradually wears off and whooping cough is far more common in older children than most doctors realise. The vaccine was developed in the 1950s. It led to a massive fall in the number of cases. <coughs> whooping cough is highly infectious and babies are most at risk. They now get three lots of vaccine. It's not so serious in older children but experts say we should be concerned if they're carrying the infection. If our adolescent population is no longer immune to whooping cough, the vaccine's worn off. If we don't boost them and don't give them that immunity, there's a real risk that they're going to get whooping cough and then they're going to give it to their own babies when they're born. 
Another top-up jab has been added since this research was carried out. It underlines the importance of vaccination for babies and reminds doctors to look out for whooping cough in older children. Brownwyn Jeffries, BBC News. The jockey, Kieran Fallon, has been banned from riding in Britain. Racing bosses took the decision after Fallon was charged as part of a betting investigation. Two other jockeys have also had their licences suspended. Fallon is still able to ride, though, in his native island. David Mills, the estranged husband of Culture Secretary Tessa Jowell, is to go on trial alongside the former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. An Italian judge has ordered that Mr Mills should stand trial in Milan as part of a fraud investigation. The trial is due to start in November. BBC bosses were awarded big pay rises last year at a time when many of their staff faced redundancy, the BBC annual report revealed today. Unions have threatened strike action over the news. Well, Nick Hyam joins me in the studio now. Uh, Nick, tell us more about these salary rises. Well, there have been some very significant increases in basic salary. The Director General, for instance, Mark Thompson, saw his basic salary go up almost 9% to £609,000. His deputy, his salary went up nearly 15%. The Director of Television, her salary went up 25%. But that was because because they all agreed to take much smaller bonuses, uh, only around 10% of a maximum of their salary rather than 30% as in the past. The result of that is that their total pay hasn't necessarily changed that much. The Deputy Director General, his total pay actually went down very slightly. The Director of Television, her pay still increased total pay, but only by around 5.5%. The BBC says it's about trying to pay the market rate for its executives, but of course, as you say, that hasn't mollified the BBC's unions. They say 2.6% offered to staff, 3,000 and uh, redundancies, it's not good enough. All right, Nick, thank you very much. The FBI says it's foiled a terrorist plot to blow up road tunnels in New York. FBI agents said plotters were discussing driving vehicles packed with explosives into several tunnels around Manhattan and then blowing them up. The plan was discovered in its very early stages during monitoring of internet chat rooms used by extremist groups. One man's reported to have been arrested in Lebanon. Let's catch up on all the weather now with Carol Kirkwood. Carol. Thank you, Darren. Well, we've had some cloud and some rain crossing parts of the south, especially today. But that's more or less all cleared off now into the North Sea and the near continent. And behind it, for the rest of this evening and tonight, it's going to be largely dry, bar some showers in the north and the west of Scotland. We've also lost the humidity, so we're looking at a more comfortable night in prospect. Tomorrow morning, we'll dawn dry and bright again with a fair amount of sunshine. Still the showers in the north and the west, but they'll tend to die away and push up into the north as this band of rain starts to swing in across Northern Ireland through the day. But for Wimbledon, it's looking dry again. Temperatures reaching about 23 degrees Celsius, which is 73 Fahrenheit, so boding well for the ladies' singles final. But for Northern Ireland for the end of the day, we're looking at some rain, some strong winds, and it will feel cool by the end of the day. For Western Scotland, a bit more cloud ahead of the rain, but the rest of Scotland will see some sunshine, as indeed will Northern England, the Midlands, and down into the southeastern corner. And as we have lost the humidity, 23 degrees Celsius in Norwich, which is 73 Fahrenheit in light winds, will actually feel quite pleasant. But as you can see too, there is some cloud around, so at times the sunshine will be hazy or it will be bright rather than sunny. But as we move into the southwestern corner, here ahead of the rain band, there will be thicker cloud and one or two showers. And the same can be said around Cardigan Bay, but inland in Wales, again, a fine afternoon. So that rain band will push across us with some windy conditions at times overnight Saturday into Sunday, leaving Sunday mostly dry with some sunshine around. And temperatures in Aberdeen peaking at about 18 degrees Celsius, our top temperature 22, which is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and in London 21. So that too is voting well for the men's finals taking place at Wimbledon on Sunday. Whatever you're doing this weekend, have a good one. Now back to Natasha. Carol, thank you. Well, that's about it from Regent's Park on a day the nation remembered. A day of tears and mourning, a day to keep silent, but also a day of tributes and thankfulness. A day to remember that amidst the bereavement and the loss, there's also courage, healing and hope. Good evening.
every breath.